So again, good morning. My name is Grant, and I'm one of the pastors on staff. And it is always a privilege and an honor to pinch it for Pastor Mark when he's away. I believe the last time that I shared, um, I think it was in July, I said that 25 minutes, I think I shared about our trip to Nepal and India, correct? And I said 25 minutes was not enough time to talk about both Nepal and India. And if you wanted to hear about India, you're going to have to email Pastor Mark. (laughs) Well, apparently some of you have done that because that's why I'm here this morning. I'm here to share the second half of that trip, which is India. But before I do, let me just thank my wife and sister for emailing Pastor Mark. I told you that would work. (laughs) So this morning, like I said, I'm going to share about our experience in India and how the church quail responded. Uh, When the host first contacted me, his name is Samuel J. Kumar. When he contacted me, he said, would you please write a message because you're going to be preaching. And so if you're a preacher and you sit, someone tells you you're going to be preaching, the first thing you want to know is to whom am I preaching? And he said to VBS uh, uh, teachers and to church planters. So I prepare a message on the prodigal son because that particular parable fascinates me. You know, it's, 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 um, it's in Luke 15, and it's, it's three parables that Jesus connects together. The parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and then the parable of the lost son. And it, it, it really fascinates me because in all three parables, there's something that's lost, right? A sheep, a coin, and a son. In all three parables, something represents God the Father, right? The, the shepherd, the, the, the woman, and the prodigal's dad. But only in the first two parables does that which represents God the Father actually go and look for what is lost, right? In the third parable, I mean, the text does say that while the son was still a long way off, the father saw him and then ran to him. But he he never actually leaves to go and find him. And that fascinates me. But as I said, I'm speaking about India, so if you want to hear the message on the prodigal son, you're going to have to email Pastor Mark. <laughs> so my sister and I, after we uh, left Nepal, um, we, have, we, we flew back to Doha, which I, I'm not sure why we flew back to Doha, but we had a seven, they flew us back to Doha so that we could wait seven hours for our connecting flight. So after a grueling seven-hour layover and then a five-hour flight, we actually arrive in Chennai at about 3.30 a.m. It takes us another hour and a half to make it outside of their airport terminal because this is what baggage came looks like at 5 a.m. in Chennai. How would you like to be the only one that doesn't speak Tamil? So we make it outside, and Samuel is there with his cousin to pick us up. And I mean, there are, you remember how many people there were? They were everywhere, and somehow this guy's head just sticks up, and he's like, Pastor! And so he finds us, and he walks us away from all this chaos, and he, and he puts us uh, on a, this corner, and he says, wait here, I'm going to get my car. And so, um, so we wait there for him. Now Samuel has a PhD in English, and he teaches at the local university, and he speaks fluent English. He leaves us with his cousin that doesn't speak a lick of English. <laughs> so it's a little awkward, because if anyone knows me, I'm going to try to engage you, right? And every time I tried to engage him, he just kept walking away from me, you know? And, and so then I'd walk up to him again, and he'd walk away from me again. You know, Samuel later told me that uh, his cousin was wondering where I got all my energy. <laughs> he did think I was crazy. So they drop us off at the hotel and tell us to get some rest and that uh, they'll be back around lunchtime. Isn't that what they said, lunchtime? And Samuel comes back with his brother, Johnny. And, um, and they're going to take us to our first uh, meeting, our first stop. And I, I believe that Samuel only rides a little motorcycle because in both uh, his cousin drove the car and now Johnny's driving the vehicle. But he's our host there. And after lunch, he kind of starts to lay out the, uh, the, the afternoon and what we're going to be doing. He says that we're going to be visiting a, a, a village that's quite a ways away. And we're going to meet the local pastor, his wife, and see his church. And then he has these things, what they call tuition centers, which are kind of like after-school programs. Um, and he wants to show us how that works. So like I said, we eat lunch and off we go. And now it takes us, I don't know how long to get there. I mean, it, it, it took us forever to get there because uh, uh, the traffic was really bad. <laughs> yeah. And you think our drivers here are bad? Oh my. So after having lunch, uh, that's when we head out for the, uh, to, to go see the first uh, village. Um, 
like I said, Samuel is our host. He's a university professor and teaches English, um, but he's also employed by WorldLink Ministries. He's employed as a cultural advisor, a cultural advisor, and the income that WorldLink pays him is what they use to fund their ministry there. So w w uh, with the Indian government, if, if I recall, I said last time when I preached that uh, the Indian government has kicked out every Christian NGO, Compassion International, World Vision. They kicked out all these NGO, uh, large Christian NGOs and millions and millions and millions of dollars. And yet Samuel and Johnny working through World Link, using the money that he gets paid as a cultural advisor are impacting thousands of lives in India every day. It's because they have a smaller footprint. The salary, um, I believe Mar Marguerite is the one who asked him, the salary that Samuel gets paid, she asked, well, who pays taxes on that? And he said, well, I do. And, and, she, and he said, that's what I contribute to the ministry. So they're doing all of this, like I said, under the, the nose of the Indian government. So they take us to the first stop. I told you it took us forever to get there because of that traffic. They introduce us to the local pastor. That's his church. Oh, I see it back there. That's his church. And, um, and then uh, if we prayed for his church. And then as we moved uh, deeper into the village, you know, we can kind of start hearing voices, but it's muddled. It's kind of, it's not really audible. So, you know, we're going through and we're riding in. I mean, it was crazy. But we're riding in, in, uh, into the village. Then we get out of the village. We start to walk with them. And then we turn a corner. And yeah, that's what the village looked like. We turn a corner and we are dead in front of probably that many kids right there. You know, and very, and they were waiting for us. They were wait, they've been waiting for us, I don't know how long, I believe at every single stop we made, and the following day we made more, but every single stop they were waiting for us, you know? And um, um, the, the kids, they stood up one by one and started quoting us Bible verses, you know? And not, not John 3.16, no, 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 Philippians 4.3, nope, nope, Ephesians 2, nope. They're quoting us scripture in Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, and I'm just like, oh my goodness. You know, they were brought up well. They sing songs to us about trusting Christ and how, how they've put uh, their, their um, tra uh, trust and faith in Christ. Then they stand up and they, they give us their testimonies. They talk to us about how the center ha has, has like, taught them how to be more obedient and listen in school. You know, how to be more obedient and listen at home, not to pick on their brothers and sisters. They said they're getting better grades. And then they said, and they taught us how to pray. You know, and I'm just like, I am, I'm shell-shocked, right? So these wonderful kids, they sing songs to us. They quote scripture from memory. They give us their testimonies. Uh, and then after which all that's done, then Samuel looks at me and goes, okay, pastor, preach. I said, you told me it was going to be church planters and VBS teachers. These are 10-year-old Hindu kids. And he's like, yes, preach. <laughs> so the message that I wrote on the prodigal son, it's really, really good. If you want to hear it, you can have to email Pastor Mark. But <laughs> I punt from that because that's going to go way over their head, right? And I, I, I uh, go to a message that Art asked me to teach at his divine design one time. And it's on serving, the difference between serving and being a servant. You know, when you serve, you choose where you'll serve, who you'll serve, how you'll serve, when you'll serve, why you'll serve. When you're a servant, you don't make those choices, he does. You know, and half the time, when he tells you to do something, you get this feeling in your stomach like, I don't want to do that. That's usually him telling you, that's me telling you to do it, right? <laughs> and, and so I told him that message about serving. And looking at, I thought it, I thought it was, I thought it was a good punt. You know, I had real high air time, long time in the air, give my team plenty of time. Blank faces, man, nothing. Thank goodness they were hungry, because that's what we did next, is we fed them. Yeah. So they take us, um, thankfully the traffic wasn't near as bad as when we w left, went to the village, and... Let me just tell you, those paper plates are really thin. And when we were serving, you remember that? They were dumping this stuff, and my hand is burning under this thing. And they're like, no, more, more, more. And I was scared to death I was going to drop one, you know, and, and, and keep that kid from eating. But anyway, I digress there. So 
They take us back to the hotel. They drop us off uh, at the front of the hotel, and they said, okay, Pastor, we're going to be here at 7 a.m. tomorrow to pick you up. And what you did tonight, you're going to have to do that 10 more times tomorrow. 10 more times tomorrow. So I'm looking at my sister, and I'm going, sis, I can't do that again. Did you see what happened? And she goes, yeah, I saw what happened. I said, I can't do that. What am I going to do? She goes, tell them the Popeye story the Popeye story. So, so the Popeye story is a story that we learned when we were in Nepal. Brad Watt, our host in Nepal, uh, he told the story. God bless you, honey. That's my niece. <laughs> um, it's a story he told in Nepal, uh, and it involved, are you ready for this? Betty Boop, Popeye, and the big bad wolf. You know, and the premise of the story was Betty Boop, which I think it was Little Red Riding Hood, but Betty Boop is on her way to see Grandma, and she's on this path, but the big bad wolf is on the path ready to pounce on her. So Popeye warns her, don't go down that path. You know, don't, don't go down that path because the big bad wolf is waiting for you. And he's waiting to pounce on you. He's going to hurt you. But little, uh, not little red, right? Him, Betty Boop doesn't trust or doesn't believe and says, hey, this way is a shortcut and will get me there much quicker. You know, so the, game, or the story uh, probably prompted a bunch of audience participation, because what Brad did is he, you know, said, okay, you guys are Betty Boop, you guys are Popeye, and you guys are the big bad wolf. And so as he told the story, every time he said Betty Boop, whoever was Betty Boop had to jump up, boop, boop, like that, you know, and if, if you were Popeye, you had to go, blow me down, you know, <laughs> serious. And if you're a big bad wolf, well, I'm not going to howl because th this microphone is right in my face, but uh, you would howl at the, like you were howling at the moon. And I got to tell you, um, it got those kids extremely active. Every one of those kids were jumping up. He assigned us. To, now, I'm not sure why he did this, but he put Marguerite in the Popeye group, and he put me in the Betty Boop group. <laughs> His wife and two children that were here on furlough made it back to Nepal two and a half months ago. He had issues with his visa and just got back last week, so maybe next time he'll put me in the Popeye group, right? <laughs> So that's the Popeye story. I'm, we're walking into the uh, lobby of the uh, hotel, you know, and I'm looking at Marguerite, and she's looking at me. She knows I'm processing, right? And I'm thinking to myself, this is not even biblical. Matter of fact, Popeye and Betty Boop, they're not even real, right? I, there's probably a big bad wolf, but Popeye and Betty Boop, they're not even real. And she's watching me. We walk into the elevator. I push the button. You know, I'm waiting for the elevator, and I'm still kind of looking at her. Elevator opens up push the button to take us up to our room or to our floor and she makes direct eye contact with me and she goes blow me down <laughs> right then i figured it couldn't be worse than the blank stares i had just received and if i couldn't share a message that these kids would understand then we would have fun with the telling of the story so Samuel and Johnny do, do come and pick us up at 7 a.m. They do take us to the first stop. It is exactly like the previous one. You know, the kids stand up. They t uh, quote us scriptures. They, um, they give us testimonies. They sing songs about loving and trusting Jesus. And then Samuel turns and says, Pastor, please preach. And I said, instead of preaching, I'm going to tell a story, a story that I'm going to need all the kids help with. And, um, and he's kind of looking at me like, what are you doing? You know, and I was like, well, you set me up. It's not my fault, right? And we separate the kids, Betty Boop, Popeye, and the Big Bad Wolf, and I start to tell the story. And I don't think there's a rhyme or reason for the story. You just keep the story going until you see all the kids participating. So when you see all the kids Betty Booping, blowing me down, and howling at the moon, then you bring the story to a crashing conclusion because the premise is, like I said, she's on her way to go see Grandma. Big Bad Wolf is waiting for her. She doesn't listen to Popeye, but right before the Big Bad Wolf pounces on her, Popeye jumps out from where he's hiding and just smashes the wolf on the head and kills it. And that's what they looked. They looked at me the same way, you know? And I said, she should have just listened to Popeye, you know? Popeye was just trying to help her. And the more I kind of told the story, I said, but even, if, even though she didn't listen to Popeye, he loved her enough to be looking out for her and still protecting her. And like I said, as I told the story, I'm like, hold on, there is a crimson thread here. And I said, you know, even though she thought he was, you know, telling her um, that that's not a shortcut, that the big bad wolf, even though she didn't listen, even though she didn't trust him, he was still there to protect her. But then I told the kids, the, the problem with that story is 
there's no such thing as Popeye. You know, there's no such thing as the big bad wolf. I said, but there is someone that we do have that is real, that is wanting to protect us, and his name is, and they all yelled, Yesu. And I look over at the translator, and he's like, Jesus. <laughs> okay, now I'm confused, right? Um, we continue to visit these centers, and every single time we did this, because I told that story, I won't say 10 times, I told it nine times, because on leaving the eighth stop that we had, Johnny, the younger brother, pulled me aside and he goes, uh, Pastor, we do not have time for the Popeye story. No Popeye. I said, okay, no Popeye. You know, and uh, we get to the next place. I go to the serving uh, message again. Very quick. We're out of there. But now we're driving to the tenth stop and I hear older brother Samuel and younger brother Johnny. They're arguing in Tamil, their language. And I don't know what they're saying. I just hear, Popeye. You know, and, and yeah, no, I, I swear. We get to the next stop and Samuel stands next to me and goes, okay, Pastor, Popeye. <laughs> nine out of ten. Nine out of ten. But, but I, I'm really confused that every time I say this, you know, the, all these kids are saying, Yesu. They're saying, Jesus, Jesus, right? So finally I asked, I said, so all, are all these kids Christian? And Johnny's real matter of fact, he goes, no, none of them. Actually, there was one, but he wasn't here today. And I'm like, that is really confusing, you know? Um, and he said, to become a Christian and to be documented as a Christian in India, you have to first get baptized, and then you have to join a church. And I said, the, these, these kids, their parents are never going to let them join the church. And he's like, no, no, they're not. I said, well, let me ask you another question. How many of these kids do you think are Christians in their hearts? And Samuel was quick. He said, all of them. And I, I am like, that blew me away. Samuel? And Johnny are, 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 are ministering and winning souls for Christ in a country that has kicked out Compassion International, has kicked out World Vision, and World Link and those two individuals have figured out a way to go there and minister. Are they ministering to thousands and thousands and thousands? Maybe not, but they're ministering to some, you know, and I think that that is what the Lord wants. Like I said, they're winning souls in where other organizations have been completely kicked out. They're, 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 winning. they're so effective in these, in these uh, centers that the local Hindu temple, the priests in that temple, ask them, would you come and do your program at, at the Hindu temple? And Jesus is taught at that Hindu temple every single day. The one thing that I saw in every center that I visited and we visited 10. The one thing I saw in every center and every child and every volunteer was um, an obedient and humble spirit. It reminded me of the obedience that Jesus talks about in Matthew 17. That's when the disciples come to him and they want to know, that's finally the church planners and VBS teachers. But they want to know who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven, right? They come to him and they say, teacher, who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And the scripture reads, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he, he put him in the midst of them and said, truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like this child, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus offers the model of a child um, not because of child, childish qualities like innocence or unselfishness because there's not a kid I know that's not selfish um, or trusting. No, he's offering the child as a model because of the status of the child. They are at the bottom of the pecking order. They illustrate humility and dependence and Jesus is very well aware of that. A child is a person of no importance in J Jewish society subject to the authority of his elders, not taken seriously, and looked at as a responsibility, someone to be looked after, not someone to be looked up to. To turn and to become like a child is therefore a radical reorientation from I gotta do anything and everything I can to get ahead in this rat race we call life, mentality to acceptance of complete dependence and humility. But we don't wanna be like children. We want to be like adults and make our own decisions, right? But we don't want to be like children because we're adults and we know what's best for us. We know what we need to succeed, right? 
But greatness in the kingdom is not based on great works, words, or successes, but on childlike humility of of spirit. Full obedience, dependence, and humility is what I saw in the children in Chennai. Albert Einstein describes this childlike humility in a letter he wrote to his friend Otto Julius Berger, and it says, people like you and I, though mortal, of course, like everyone else, do not grow old no matter how long we live. What I mean is we never cease to stand like curious children before the great mystery into which we were born. That's childlike humility. I saw the same childlike humility, as I said, in both Samuel and Johnny, which is why they're, and their volunteers, which is why their uh, uh, centers are so successful. They are doing for these children what the children can't do for themselves. And I, I can promise you, God always responds to that. You know, and he wants us, all of us, to have that same childlike humility because, you see, God loves the children, but he can't use the child the same way he can use an adult, right? You know, uh, C.S. Lewis in his book, uh, Mere Christianity, wrote, Christ never meant that we were to remain children in intelligence. On the contrary, he told us to, to be not only as harmless as doves, but to be wise as serpents. He wants a child's heart, but a grown-up's head. God wants to use those whose hearts are committed and obedient to him. Uh, sec- uh, I think it's 2 Chronicles 16.9 says, For the eyes of the Lord range, range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. So he's looking for us, right? And all we have to do is be obedient. I, I, can, I say that because I believe I've experienced this firsthand. And I believe that my act of obedience is the reason I'm standing before you guys today. Look, I'm not anointed, I'm not a theologian, I'm not a scholar. If you were to ask me, what are you, Grant? I would say, I'm obedient. And in December of 2008 is when I, my wife, my sister and I, but I was convinced, we had this Christmas tree uh, in our formal living room, and it was a big Christmas tree, and it was like the Mount Vesuvius of Christmas trees, meaning it erupted gifts, like every, almost like old geyser, man, it just kept erupting gifts, you know? And I mean, there was, I think my daughters at that time were 15 and 12, and there are iPhones, iPads, iPods, you you know, I paid, right? But um, (laughs) there's all this stuff, and, and I'm convinced that they don't realize how fortunate they are. So, so uh, and I, I bring that to my wife and sister, and so what we decided to do, I, I'm, I'm gonna sell you out. <laughs> Margie's like, let's go to Starbucks and get $5 Starbucks gift card. I said, to give to home, let's go to McDonald's where they can buy a meal, you know? But, so we did, we bought $300 worth of uh, McDonald's gift cards in $5 increments to go and give them to the people, to the homeless over by St. Mary's Dining Hall. And so Christmas morning, before we had breakfast, you know, we went down and we started to give them away. It was just my wife, my sister and I, and our two daughters, uh, Ashley and Amber. And we were done, I mean, in minutes. I mean, minutes. I was humbled. So I took my money out of my pocket, started giving $5 bills. Don't do that downtown. I, I promise you, if you do that, you are going to have a long line. Really long. But it was after that that I saw what looked like, like a migrant farm worker. And he was walking away from St. Mary's Dining Hall, and he had his, a girl in each hand, looked like his two daughters. You know, and I remember seeing him, and I remember thinking to myself, you didn't just eat Christmas dinner at St. Mary's Dining Hall, did you? Because we're going to go home, and we're going to have eggs, bacon, sausage, pancakes, potatoes. I'm half Japanese, rice. Uh, and, and, I mean, we're going to have this huge meal, and you just had... Christmas breakfast at St. Mary's Dining Hall? You know, and it was then that the Spirit of God revealed to me that I was the one, me, that didn't realize how fortunate I was, that that God had gifted me with gifts and talents to where I could go out and earn a living to buy those gifts. You know, the Spirit impressed upon me that that man may never even make minimum wage. So that act of obedience um, 
prompted us feeding the homeless, which we did the first Saturday of every month for uh, over 12 years. And I believe, um, and I believe that that act of obedience or the, the feeding of the homeless, I believe that's what brought me to Pastor Mark's attention because he called us up and uh, took us to Wendy's to talk about how our homeless feeding, yeah, Wendy's, yeah, and told us to eat off the 99 cent. No, he didn't say that. <laughs> He, he, he was thinking it, I could tell. But, um, but I think that that's what caught his attention, which prompted a part-time job that turned into a full-time job and has brought me friends and relationships at this church and other churches that I hold so dear in, to my heart. And it was just because I was obedient. One act of obedience on Christmas morning in 2008 changed my life forever, and it's still making changes. So what about you? Are you obedient? Are, are you obedient in your faith? You know, have, have, you, have, have you confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and then believed in your heart that God raised him from the dead? Or do you let the busyness of life prevent you from being obedient? Are you obedient in love? Do you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength? Maybe, yeah. But do you love your neighbor as yourself? That's where we struggle. Are you obedient in serving? Are you therefore going and making disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Are you teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you? You know, one day, all of us will stand before our Lord, and we will bow in front of him. Uh, Romans 14, 11 and 12 says, It is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Now, I don't think this account of ourselves that we give to God is going to be our sinful nature and, and the bad things that we've done. Psalm 103, 12 says, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Or Micah 7, 19 says, you will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all of our iniquities into the depths of the sea. No, I believe that the account we will have to give to God is did we do what he wanted us to do? Were we obedient? Ephesians 2.10 says we are Christ's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do the good works that God prepared in advance. Did you do them? That's what I think we will have to bring in account. And if you did them, did you do them with childlike humility? Oh, almost forgot. I said at the very beginning of the message that we were going to share about uh, the second half of my trip to uh, Nepal and India with my sister and, and, show, and then tell you how the church responded. Out of the thousand kids that we saw on that day, when we got back, Marguerite's Compassion and Justice Committee and uh, Quail's Global Focus combined f uh, funds and sent them to, uh, through WorldLink to the kids in, in uh, Chennai. And every single kid that we visited got a brand spanking new pair of shoes the first new pair of shoes for most of them before they started school. That's Sam. Samuel. That's the cousin that thinks I'm crazy. <laughs> See, obeying God means moving aside and allowing God, His Word, His Holy Spirit, and his way of operating to move into our lives. We can't claim to love God without obeying him and his word. Anyone who wants to know God, to walk closely with him, must obey him. So let's, let's us walk closely with him and enjoy the benefits of our obedience. Would you pray with me? <sighs> Heavenly Father, just... Thank you that you invite us into relationship. Thank you that, that you care enough that, that you're involved in our lives. You're, you're not an inactive God. You are so active. God, help us be obedient 
to what it is that you would have us do. God, if we were all obedient to what you call us to do, this world would be a much better place. It would be a different place. But God, every journey starts with the first step. Let's be obedient and start that step together. For we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.